we finally have passed from cloud cover to sunshine and uh, it's good it looks like it's going to be a pretty day and then it's going to turn into a hot day which is just as good too <coughs> I know my back appreciates the sunshine because then it tends to warm it <coughs> warm it up and cause my whatever's wrong with my back to relax some and then to just be still if I didn't sit at the computer I probably wouldn't have back pain <laughs> it goes to show you where I'm at but as we adjust our lifestyle sometimes to the choices that we've made we likewise need to adjust our spiritual life to reflect in our practical life those choices that we've made to follow Jesus to suffer the consequences of our actions and to be responsible for them but also to recognize that God has something in store for each and every one of us to do that he would want and has desire to save us from ourselves but not just for the sake of being saved, but rather for the sake of his Father's will to be accomplished in the world, because it shall be, irregardless of whether you participate with God or not. God's will will be done. There is no doubt. The aspect of involving you is one of salvation process that we put theological terms and try to call it sanctification for some fancy name but the reality is your participation is simply being one with God in love because if you love God you want to be where he's at and do what he does and enjoy what he's doing because you'll find great satisfaction in doing and accomplishing what you were designed and what you were purposed to do which was to have fellowship with God the Father and his Son and his spirit. Now there are people that are out in the world that are Christians that sometimes only stick with knowing the Holy Spirit and so they get all wrapped up in spiritual gifts and spiritual dealings and spiritize this and spiritualize that and get all wrapped up in one aspect of God himself. There are others that get caught up in Jesus only and they just do Jesus this and Jesus that and they always see the Son of Man and they see Christ and they create these ideas of his heart or his love or his mother or his aspect about him and it's always Jesus only and not moving on to the Father and yet there's always both cases something missing because the Holy Spirit said that he would cause us to remember what Jesus said and what Jesus said was when he was here that he would introduce us to the Father and that he would cause us to have fellowship with the Father. So, in reality, there's always one step more that we ought to do. And that one step is, do you know your Father in heaven and how much he loves you? That's what it's all about, is that it's to bring you to realization of God Almighty in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. In Spurgeon, <clears throat> he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. In contending with certain sins, there remains no mode of victory but by flight. The ancient naturalist wrote much of basilisks, whose eyes fascinated their victims and rendered them easy prey. So the mere gaze of wickedness puts us in solemn danger. He who would be safe from acts of evil must hasten away from occasions of it. A covenant must be made with our eyes, not even to look upon the cause of temptation, for such sins only need a spark to begin with, and a blaze follows in an instant. Who would be wantonly enter the leper's prison and sleep amid its horrible corruption? He only who desires to be leprous himself would thus court contagion. If the mariner knew how to avoid a storm, he would do anything rather than run the risk of weathering it. Cautious pilots have no desire to try how near the quicksand they can sail or how often they may touch a rock without springing a leak. Their aim is to keep as nearly as possible in the midst of a safe channel. This day I, ha I may be exposed to great peril, but let me have the serpent's wisdom to keep out of it and to avoid it completely. The wings of a dove may be of more use to me today than the jaws of a lion. 
It is true I may be an apparent loser by declining evil company, but I had better leave my cloak than lose my character. It is not needful that I should be rich, but it is imperative upon me to be pure. No ties of friendship, no chains of beauty, no flashings of talent, no shafts of ridicule must turn me from the wise resolve to flee from sin. The devil I am to resist, and he will flee from me, but the lusts of the flesh I must flee, or they will surely overcome me. O God of holiness, preserve thy Josephs, that Madame Bubble bewitch them not with her vile suggestions. May the horrible trinity of the world, the flesh, the devil, the f of the world, the flesh, and the devil, never overcome us. The reality of life as a born-again Christian is a fact that we live in sin, and sin abounds about us, and sin is involved around us, and that our flesh is sinful. It is carnal, and it will desire always to create in us a place of holding itself and feeding itself corruption that it might gain strength over our spirit, which is inside of us, warring against our own flesh. Most of what people tell me whenever they say that they've been attacked by the devil or they've been, you know, under some oppression or under some frustration or some angst or some anxiety has in all occasions that I have found, been they are warring against their own flesh, their own desires, their own wanton place of getting involved in the world and participating with it to the salvation or to the, the temptation that they create for themselves, causing much of their own frustration because they are no longer of this world and they're still trying to live in it. When you have one foot in heaven and one foot in hell, it's kind of hard to live in a world where you never know which way you're going. Are you leaning to the left or to the right? And that's the frustration that there is in living in the flesh. So, first place to be, I would say, is always aware that your first trial and tribulation you look at is whether, not whether or not it's from God or Satan, but whether it is your own flesh causing you to trip up yourself by yourself as you've done it to yourself. Where and what were you doing when this temptation came upon you and you either participated in it, gave into it, or did you flee from it? Because temptation is not sent by God. Temptation, no one is tempted by God. But they are tempted when they are given over to that which is a provocation in front of them to either participate in it or to flee from it or to reject it completely as being a part of their life. What will you do when you fall into that provocation of your flesh? Do you feed your flesh or will you feed your spirit to be able to resist the flesh and to flee from its desires? That's what Spurgeon is saying and that's what we need to be aware of, our own fleshy carnality. Thank <laughs> you.